Hello, stupid. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Zama. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Doing good on this little rainy afternoon. Oh, is it rainy? It is. Yeah, it's super gloomy today. Are you guys done with winter already then? Basically. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had one snowfall, well, two if you want to count, like two centimeters, and our coldest day in like 25 years, and now we're yeah. into spring. <laughs> I'm kidding. I like forgot what Vancouver was uh, like the um, I think October to like yeah mid January is really miserable and the rain like kills me I can't mm -hmm. but afterwards like the rest of winter is pretty chill yeah no it's it's usually very mild it doesn't really go in the negatives that much and then it just rains nonstop yeah. and it's I not even the fun the... like thunderstorm it's just mild rain I know and it's just like kind of cold kind of wet and nonstop and you don't see the sun and it's great you know mm -hmm. it's horrible I, i can't but i was talking to uh one of our friends in common actually mm -hmm. whose baby is turning one in, in uh, end of february oh yeah and she was like oh i don't know what i'm gonna do for the birthday and stuff like that and like it's possible that end of february you guys could have a nice some nice weather and do like something in a park totally that's insane to me that's wow totally. i do miss that a bit Yeah, um, I know it's, yeah, it's pretty much by all the time. See, the rain doesn't get to me when I moved here. People are like, oh, like nonstop rain. It's just the cold that gets to me. And that's why I moved out of Ontario because I couldn't do the cold. Um, the rain doesn't get to me, but hopefully I'm going to Hawaii next week. So it'll be a really nice break from this rain. Yeah, that is nice. That's really nice. Yeah. Are you How's your winter going? Right? I am, yeah. I have a couple weeks off, so I'm going to Hawaii, hopefully, with my parents. I wanted to take them on a little vacation. They've never been. Cute. I haven't been to Hawaii since 2019, so I'm super excited. Cute. Super cute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, me, I don't know. I've been looking for opportunities to go get a few days in the sun, something like that, but I don't think it's happening this winter. So yeah. I'm just going to have to sit tight and wait for the sun to come back naturally. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know, right? My um, birthday is at the end of February also. And I was looking with Justin, should we take like a long weekend and go somewhere? But I don't know. It just feels like there's a lot of people here who, who will want to celebrate with me and have like family dinner that I'm, or family brunch actually this year that we're doing. So Yeah. Your family loves to brunch. My family, well, we do love to brunch. Yeah. Breakfast you guys are best. big brunch people. Oh, yeah. Maybe I it's a brunch thing. I was going to say, I don't think Indians brunch. Like, I don't, if I told my parents, oh, you want to host brunch, they'd be like, what? No, come well, for like, dinner. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't have that much breakfast food to begin with. No, we do. Um, It wouldn't be breakfast. It would be like more of like a lunch, I think. Like, like yeah, like yeah. a brunch. But I think like, I think Indian families just like to host dinner more. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I'm like, I think like even our brunch foods have like just so much carbs in it. Like we have these things called parantas and it's just like <gasps> potatoes. Oh, are the best. Yeah. It's so freaking good. It's like carb on carb. It's like potato, like roti stuff with potatoes. So yeah. carb on carb. Uh, we like we have brunch foods. We brunch heavy, but I don't think people host each other for brunch. But you know what? It might just be my family. There might be other families that are like, we yeah, brunch yeah. so much. Like, I want to say traditionally, but maybe that means nothing. But traditionally, what would like an Indian family eat for breakfast? Like in India? Or yeah. no, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Maybe here too. I think like an Indian breakfast for an Indian family would be like parantas. I think that would be the best, biggest thing. And it's like mainly alu parantas, which is potato. I mean, um absolutely 100% on board yeah every morning every day oh there's these i don't know if you've had these but it's like puris it's like these little like puff rotis they're smaller oh no i don't think so that would like potatoes it's usually just like potatoes and a car another carb to substitute right. why not okay um yeah 
like my family like that's like very like what not even once a month like if me and my sister both happen to be there my mom's like oh i'm gonna make all luparantas but other than that yeah. that's usually we're just yeah me and my sister aren't even big break, break, uh, breakfast people so i think my parents just end up eating a healthy breakfast we're not up anyways i know i've like stopped eating breakfast in the last few years um mm -hmm. and i kind of want to get back to it but i'm really like on it. like mostly I don't like making dirty dishes first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Like making eggs is all good. And I love eating eggs and toast. But like having to wash a pan first thing in the morning. Yeah. I'm not into it. Yeah. I'm not a big breakfast person either. I like naturally intermittent fasts. Like I yeah, same. before it was a yeah. thing. Yeah. Because if I, if I eat just like, for example, like a toast in the morning, then I'll be hungry all day. But if I yeah. don't eat until like two or three, and I'm not hungry. And then I just eat in the afternoon. I know. Same. But then I'll make like whatever I'm having like as my first meal. Usually a breakfast. Like I usually have oh, eggs yeah. and yogurt and stuff. But I just can't eat first thing when I wake up. Um, I love to like just sip on my coffee for like one hour. <laughs> and then I'm like at 3 p.m. I'm like, oh, I should eat some meal now. <laughs> they all say like there's nothing best for your stomach than coffee on an empty stomach right it's like yeah that and orange juice on an empty stomach why why not exactly and then you're like why am i dying and i have no energy and i can't be productive what is this random anxiety <laughs> at 11 a.m totally me <laughs> speaking of i'm having my third coffee. i know same i'm like still on my first coffee i do have random anxiety <laughs> <laughs> well all right, episode 12, it's a Sanya episode, so I've got a little bit of humor to start off this morning. <laughs> you ready? Let's do this. Why do octopi always win in fights? Because of ink? Squid ink? No. Why do you try to guess every time? Because <laughs> you phrase it as a question, I feel like I need to add that's something <laughs> Oh, so that's a joke structure. It's a typical joke structure. Okay. All yeah, right. Tell me. You ready for the punchline? <laughs> because they're well armed. <laughs> I get it. Do you? Do you want to eight explain arms. it to us? Eight tentacles. Is it eight? Yeah. Octopus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I got nervous there for a second. I was like, wait, is it? I think the only reason this is funny, me starting to segment with that. It's because you're so bad at jokes. Like, I am, I'm not, I'm not I'm asking you a question. You don't have to answer. I feel like I always need to figure it out. Answer. Then I have to say something once you've delivered the punchline to like, yeah. let people know I've understood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, and like a few weeks ago, you tried to just make your own joke afterwards on the spot. And it wasn't even funny. And you just... It's I know, and it's so funny as you're saying that. I'm thinking of like maybe I could bring an octopus joke back into this. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Uh, I think you might have to put ink to paper for that. Ooh, straight from job. the brain. <laughs> no, you were thinking of that all day. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I picked it at random. Oh, I have to mark it off actually, so I don't repeat it again some other day. Just yeah. There we go. All right, since you started us off with a dad joke, let's go into what I have for you today. I'm so excited. It's been two weeks in a row now that you keep complete mystery. I think I've been doing that for a lot. No, usually I'm proud I of myself. What you're doing. Do, do you? I'm usually like, and I really want to tell you, but a part of me is like, I don't. I don't, and I know you wouldn't do this to me, but I feel like I tell you, and then you'd go into your own deep dive, and then you'd like <laughs> not be as excited. I don't know why, but um, oh my god, that's funny. No, I like right. it. Let's uh, let's try to do that. So this week, I have for you the third man syndrome. What? Have you heard of it? I don't think so. Okay, well, me neither. Until I started this deep dive. Mm -hmm. Um, I got it just popped up on Instagram where like I think BuzzFeed did an article saying I just learned about the third man syndrome and I can't stop thinking about it and I was like I'm in um, and I went down this little rabbit hole oh so God, the third man syndrome it describes a strange phenomenon 
experienced by explorers or other survival or others in survival situations in which a presence intervenes at a cr critical moment to offer encouragement, guidance, and support. What do you mean a presence? All right. So that's kind of what this episode is about. So third man syndrome is a term, right? It comes from a poem, a T.S. Eliot poem called The Wasteland. And here's a little stanza from the poem. Um, Who's the third that walks beside you? When I count, there's only you and I together. But when I look up ahead the white road, there's another one walking beside you. Gilding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I don't know whether a man or woman, but who is that on the other side of you? So it's the victim, their group, and then a third. Ooh. So um, this uh, poem was inspired by the real-life experience of Ernest Shackleton, an Irish explorer who went on a near-death expedition in Antarctica in 1960. Um, so basically, a little brief history here about what this poem was inspired by and then what this term comes from, okay? Okay. So... Um, the term comes from um, this poem. So it was a crew in 1914 to 1916 on the Endurance Expedition. Specifically, there was uh, Ernest Shackleton, the leader of the expedition, Frank Worsley, the captain of the ship, and Tom Crean, the second officer. The crew of the Endurance had gotten stranded in Antarctica for two years, losing their main ship in the process, until six of them sailed on one of their lifeboats for a 17 day cross open ocean across the open ocean of uh, to reach the South Georgia Island. They were aiming for the whaling station in order to uh, ask for help rescuing the 20 plus men that they left behind on the ship. Right. Fortunately, uh, Worsley was a gifted navigator. He got them there. Uh, but because of the storms, they landed on the wrong side of the island and half their crew had gotten sick or injured. So they left them behind. Uh, where they landed, and the three of them carried on. So this is Shackleton, Worsley, and Creed. They trekked through the previously untraversed interior of the island, which consisted of snowy mountains with no adequate supplies or equipment except for some rope. They didn't even have sleeping bags um, and had to lie down right on the snow. So oh. all of them later recounted um, on their journey to reach the whaling system um, that they felt another presence with them. So there was three of them walking, but all of them felt like there was a fourth man with them. Um, so basically, after they reached uh, the whaling sta uh, station, um, they it took them, because of the weather conditions, 36 hours to reach there. And then it took them four months to get back uh, to Elephant Island to save the rest of the people uh -huh. they left behind. And miraculously, all of them had survived. Wild. But what you mean, like, they felt there was someone there so a lot of these stories we'll go through today is that everyone reports in these like near life or death situations that they have someone with them and the only way we can kind of rationalize this is that there's like a guardian angel kind of looking out for them wild and um what's crazy is that you can kind of say that in like these life or death scenarios it's kind of your brain rationalizing that there's someone else with you so you don't feel alone but sometimes it's also a shared experience. Well, yeah, there, there were already three people. Yeah. So they just like remember a fourth person there, but they... They have a feeling of a presence. And also when you're going through such a big survival, like fighting to survive in this experience, you don't even remember every little thing you've been through, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of just like a presence following you interesting uh what's even more interesting is that uh from all the stories that i've gathered uh some people have like a shared experience which kind of blows me away because it's like okay like if you went through a life or death scenario and you're like hey i didn't feel alone i felt like someone was with me i'm like oh maybe that's just your brain rationalizing it like you being alone but when it's a bunch of people feeling the same presence yeah. or when the presence takes form of someone that would comfort you <gasps> it's insane um so there's lots of different stories um obviously i went down a deep reddit thread 
And some of these stories just blew me away. Okay. About who this third man is. Wait, so was that the conclusion of their of their exhibition? Like yeah, the... so they basically they found where they're supposed to go and then they even made it back to their men um, and who were all survived. But as they recounted these stories, all three of them in separate occasions was talked about feeling a fourth presence. Okay, okay, okay. So that is where the term third man syndrome came from, from this um, poem. Um, and that's where the name the came from. This, yeah. Exactly. That's where this name came from. So I have mm-hmm. another little similar story about another one back in the day. Um, I think this would probably be like the second time the third man syndrome was kind of documented. Um, So this is from 1933, a British explorer, Frank Smith, almost became the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Uh, (laughs) The journey on top was nearly disastrous. His entire hiking party had fallen behind and unable to make it through because of sweeping wind, snow, ice, and low oxygen. The usual things you'd expect on Mm -hmm. uh, your climb to Mount Everest. Uh, so, and this is 1933, so no one has actually been up there at this point, right? And then Smith continued on, but he actually never made it to the top. He missed it by a thousand feet. How do you miss the top? But I'm guessing because there's so much snow, uh, and just wind, so there's snow blowing in front of you. You don't know where the top is, right? I mean, up. <laughs> like, I kind of want to agree with you, but I don't get it. <laughs> I'm, just think, I'm just saying, like, he's like, you know, there's snow blowing. He's like, I can't do it. And he was like a thousand feet away. Oh, okay. Like, he gave up. Like, uh, yeah. Like, he, he, okay. Yeah. Because it, it sounded like he almost, like, he was like, up there. He's like, like he doesn't feel like he it's thought it. He was at the top. He thought he was at the top, but he didn't. Like, he nearly, he, like, he missed it. It's like, what do you mean he missed it? But, like, he didn't make it. I think he didn't make it. Um, yeah. I love, I love, like, can you imagine being like famous for almost, almost making something? It. Exactly right. <laughs> um, but I think I mean, he, maybe he wasn't even famous until this his his story came out about the third man uh, factor, because later okay. in his uh, diary he described um, that scientists commonly refer to as a third man syndrome. He recounted at one point on the top of his ascent. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a candle mink milk mint cake and broke it in half. And then he felt the need to turn around and give it to his companion. But then he realized there was no one there because his entire hiking party had fallen behind. Um, okay. And that's where he I was need- like, I just felt, even though I was climbing alone, I felt this strong feeling of having a companion beside me. That's so weird. What are you feeling? Also, no, no, I bet I'm, I, like, I got distracted because what kind of cake? They called it a Kendall mint cake. Candle? Like Kendall. Um, like Kendall Jenner. Can- oh, okay. I don't it's know. Purpose, that's why they call it that. Maybe it's a cool brand. <laughs> um, oh, but that's why. Like, he, he was so certain someone was there that he, like, split it in half and, like, was about to share it with Yeah, them. and then you realize he was all alone. Um, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's weird. But also, like... Like the lack of oxygen mm-hmm. and the exhaustion, the fatigue kicking in. Yeah, this one like I you guess you can fully violence. rationalize to your brain, making you feel like you're not alone, or you're kind of mm-hmm. just going crazy with the lack of oxygen. Totally. But the first story, I'm like, there. It feels like there's someone there, you know, because if it's three yeah. of you feeling that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's more compelling because there's so many other people are involved right yeah so basically the um the author of a book called the third man factor surviving the impossible we have the writer john greiser here he claims that there is a, several scientific explanations of the third man syndrome such as biochemical reactions to misfire um in your brain activity but he believes that the spiritual explanation makes most, the most sense and i kind I mean, of agree with him yeah also, like, I don't know if we had this conversation on, on the podcast yet or not. Oh, maybe it was off air. But, like, for me, it's like, well, you know, the the saying, like, any science advanced enough is indistinguishable from indistinctable. And 
like you can't tell it fr- apart from magic. <laughs> I hate that. I love this quote, but I can never say it. <laughs> you know, <it. laughs> I feel like we did talk about this on the podcast um, during the yeah. lamp episode. We might have. Yeah, yeah. So if, for me, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, well, you know, I, I'm okay with a spiritual experience being triggered by something biological. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, it's the 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 takeaway is kind of the same for me. Yeah, totally. Do you believe in like guardian angels? Um, I mean, I think I have a problem with the term angel. Okay. Too religious because uh, it's very like religious associated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but like. Someone looking out for you? How about that? Do you believe that there's that, someone I could, looking yeah, out for you? Yeah. yeah. I could be on board with that. Yeah. I could be on board with that. It's always like... Um, but yeah, I guess so. It's just I don't have anyone who died who I would think would care about me that way. <laughs> no, but in fair, all fairness, same. As I read these stories, I'd be like... I kept thinking that too. Like, if I had someone up there, who would it be? You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but maybe like as I grow older and other people die, it's like, what maybe I hope when you die, you'll check in on me. <laughs> sure, I'll be your guardian angel. <laughs> Kills me now. He's like, I need someone up there. <laughs> um, but you know what? Another mm. thing, though, your guardian agent doesn't have to be someone or sorry, the person looking out for you also doesn't have to be someone that was it previous in your life and died and passed on. It always could just be someone that we believe is out there looking out for us. And it doesn't have yeah. to be someone that we've known. Maybe, you know, we were assigned this person at birth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or this alien. Yeah, it doesn't I have think... to be religious in any way either. No, no, no. I think... I I do believe that, you know, the universe provides. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it necessarily always takes a form of a person mm-hmm. physically that guides you. Um, but I think there's there's, you know, certain things and events and and um even thoughts that are put in your way that are um there as guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, before we move on to what forms your the person looking out for you takes, uh, I do have a little story here from um, the book, uh, The Third Man Factor, Surviving the Impossible. So he, he, uh, he writes that during the September 11 terrorist attacks in 2001, many survivors reported feeling a presence of the third man who guided them to safety. For example, a group of firefighters that were ta- trapped in the North Tower of the World Trade Center repu- reported feeling a presence of a mysterious figure who led them down the stairs to safety. One of the firefighters later described the experience as follows. He led us right to the right stairway and said, you're going to be okay now. You're going to be all right. We didn't know who he was, but he was an angel to us. <gasps> oh my God, I just had full body shivers. Right? And there's countless stories about people during the terrorist attacks feeling a presence. Why? Wow. Um, oh. Some of these people named their presence. They said that there was a gentleman named Michael that came up to them, that helped them, that t- telling them they're going to be okay. And then they did survive. Um, I find that insane. Yeah. I think, I mean, the report of the, the firefighters... I find uh, crazy and compelling, but without going into the details of every report, like there's obviously a lot, a lot, a lot of people involved in that incident. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously a lot of good Samaritan helping out each other and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So like, and it it would be hard to get back in touch with someone that you saw once, like protecting you from something. Right. So there could be some actual people, actual humans. Totally. I totally agree with that one. So that one can also be rationalized, right? You can also think that there is, you have a guardian angel there looking out for you, or it was just actually someone who helped you. And then looks like they disappeared, but they moved on to help someone else, you know? Yeah. Totally. 
What about the stories that we've all heard about those people that worked at the World Trade Center the day of September 11, 2001, and then they had something, a gnawing feeling, a voice in their head telling them to not go to work. Have you heard about those stories? Yeah. Yeah. And some people who turned around like halfway uh, to work and stuff like that exactly so while we talk about the third man syndrome there are more and more stories coming out about a voice in people's head mm. and i thought these were more insane than anything because i find that this can't be explained off and a lot of the times this voice in your head is your own oh, so yeah. i'm going to what what do you mean i'm going to send you a story here okay and if you could read it out for us. I was in a serious car wreck at 18 involving a speeding fully loader tractor trailer. Sorry, that was a like a sequence of words that really tripped me. Uh, <laughs> and right before impact, I heard a very clear voice that sounded just like me. And that said, relax for impact. Told me if I survived that, then... I had to be prepared for the next step, counted the flips and rolls of the vehicle for me, and then told me to shut the engine down, gather the important things, and kick my way out. It very much felt like a second me in the car to talk me through, and it's probably why I survived, because it kept me completely calm and able to function through the whole thing. I'm pretty sure I was just talking to myself, but I didn't feel like it. Wow. And there were a crazy amount of these stories where people were about to get in an accident and their own head, their own voice told them, prepare for impact. Whoa, that's crazy. Um, There was a couple of stories where, you know, especially back in the day when we didn't wear seatbelts as often. And yeah. people would get in their car and they'd be driving and their own voice in their head would be like, put your seatbelt on now. Whoa, it's like, it's like your consciousness split into two, uh, uh, like entities. Yeah, exactly. Right? And it's come, <gasps> and I keep thinking of this as like the devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder. Um, You know, that <laughs> little, I mean, I guess I would say cartoon that I think of in my head, where the angel is yeah. like, get it together, something's gonna happen. And then instead of panicking in this moment, you're now your guardian angel is kind of guiding you through what to do next. Did you ever have something like that happen? I did not. As I read this, I was like, it'd be so cool if something did. But no, yeah. did you? Not voices, no. No. I do get like sometimes struck by like a very, very strong feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, And like... It's just like an instinct. I don't know, and I guess an instinct, yeah. And like, like sadly, often I ignore it. I'm really bad at listening to it. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, most recently, I was struck with like random anxiety that I was going to bump into someone that I really didn't want to bump into. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no, it's going to be fine. I'm still going to do the thing. And then I did the thing and bumped into them. That's insane. Right? Right. Um, so. But you were fine. But I was fine. No. Like and, I, and, I, and I get yourself. those kind of yeah. things sometimes. But never get like actual like distinct voice from like someone talking to you. That's like for me, it feels really like a split, like your subconscious taking entity and like taking like um, this sentient form, mm -hmm. right? And being like, okay. I totally agree. So I'm glad that you're tripping out about this voice in your head just as much as I was. Uh, because then I came across the story from 1997 about oh this woman where the voices in her head told her about the brain tumor that she had. <gasps> what? So um, in London, a woman was correctly told about a brain tumor by the voices in her head. Um, so, so the woman had no previous psychological problems. And first heard a voice uh, while she was at home just reading, 
which told her not to be afraid and said that it was a friend that wanted to help. She thought she got went crazy and then she sought out medical help. The uh, consultant psychiatrist, and I can't say their name, it's Mr. Ikuwu e- e- Azuku wrote that sure. about the, uh, wrote about his treatment um, wrote about the treatment of this woman in the British uh, Medical Journal. She said that uh, he said that she appeared to be cured after receiving counseling and medication, but while on holiday, her hallucinations returned. This time, there were two voices. They told her to return to England immediately because there was something wrong with her. Back in London, the voices gave her an address to go to. The brain scan department of a large hospital in London. The woman persuaded her husband to drive her there. And then keep in mind, this is 1997. So you're not immediately Googling these kind of things, right? So how did the voices in your head know about, like, you know, this brain scan address? So insane. And her husband drove her there and a brain tumor was discovered, which was uh, duly removed. And after that, she made a full recovery. And here's the kicker. This is what threw me off the edge. As she regained consciousness after the operation, she heard the voices for a final time. They told her, we're pleased to have helped you. Goodbye. Oh, no. (laughs) What? Yeah. (sighs) So uh, one of the explanations that was put forward by the medical um, conference where Dr. I can't say his name, uh, Azui described the case uh, was that she had sensed a feeling in her head, which led her to a fear of tumor. That was the only explanation they can put forward because other than that, everyone else is as freaked out as we are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Imagine the voices oh. in your head telling you this and then like at the end, it done being right. And then the, you're like, okay, well, think we're pleased to have done work with you. Bye now. Like, where do they go? Okay, wait. I have two um, kind of like same theories. Mm -hmm. Kind of one that goes back to your red lamp episode or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, if we are in some sort of simulation, it's like the entity like playing the simulation Mm -hmm. that's stepping in. Mm -hmm. kind of thing right or the consciousness playing the simulation or like that stepping in and doing like hey this we need to handle yeah or um kind of the same you know like um like the theories of uh, reincarnation how you're the same entity just going through different lives and stuff like that was that like that higher entity that's like stepping in yeah and it could be the same for, like, the third man syndrome. Yeah. It, 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 like, literally, to me, or, like, when I was reading this, I was like, okay, but, like, you know how people talk about when sometimes you have brain tumors, the part of your head yeah. it's pressing on makes you do crazier things. You act like something else or, you you know, you, you turn into something else and you start acting differently. Yeah. That's what I'm like, oh, that's explaining the voices in her head, you know? And yeah. She had a feeling and it just, you know, like saying that out loud, maybe. But the fact that after they removed the tumor, she regained consciousness and they said, we're pleased to be of service. Yeah. That's why. Did she say what the voices sounded like? Was it her own voice? No. um, So because it was 1997, there's not that much information about it. I actually Mm. found a comment on... um, reddit talking about it where someone's like i don't know if i remember hearing this case properly and then i just found one article around it uh by the irish times wow okay you know the um did you watch a grace anatomy yes so izzy when she gets her brain tumor tumor she sees her like uh, dead fiance yeah and he's like i'm here for you I'm here for you and tries to convince her, like, and leads her to discovering that she has a tumor. That is so true. Right? So I wonder if it was inspired by that. So many medical um, things I hear about always go back to Grey's Anatomy. I know. (laughs) (laughs) They're a really good job overreacting these situations. But yeah, totally. Um, And it's so funny that you actually bring that up 
because there's so many stories about not only people, um, you know, that are dying, that see someone that is already dead to be like, hey, come on over, like, you know, I'm here for you. Or there's a lot of stories where someone has already passed. Wait, 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 wait. wait. (laughs) Just imagining myself on my deathbed now and like my grandfather is just like casually like, hey, come on over. (laughs) What are you on about? Uh, well, hey, come on over. Just, you know, come sit. Come on over. I'm here to take you. It'll be fun. Don't worry. Here's some candy. Our guardian angel is actually a full-out creep. No, I'm joking. Um, but there's a lot of stories where someone you know has passed. And like, or you don't know that they have passed yet. And then people have hallucinations of them before they even find out that they've passed. And that's them kind of being like, hey, I'm crossing over now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. But I, get, I mean, brain tumors can very um, obviously cause hallucinations and like and different uh, brain function that are not normal. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the hallucinations are clearly leading you to know that you have a brain tumor is really wild. And a hundred percent. And then the brain, the hallucination is thanking you after like, or like yeah. that to or, me, like, yeah, they should totally do like a black mirror episode on this one. Oh yeah. That would have been insane. But like a modern day version where the brain tumor is like, Oh, no problem. Like, here's my tip. Like, <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, <laughs> please tip your tumor. Yeah, tip your tumor. <laughs> yeah, nice you've been teaching the service. Please consider reviewing and tipping your tumor. <laughs> Imagine it. Wild. All right. So, I have another story for you, um, okay. which is also very interesting. So, true story. Back in 1965, when my mother was young, she was driving down a long road in the middle of nowhere in the USA. When her car broke okay. down, When her car broke down, it was very cold with snow on the ground. It was getting dark. There was no one nearby. No cell phones, of course. All of a sudden, she saw a man walking in a white suit, uh, walking up the road towards her. He was immaculately dressed. Um, A nice and friendly looking man. He asked if he could check under the hood. And of course, she said yes. He did. (laughs) (laughs) He opened the hood, appeared to be touching a few things. And then a few seconds later, closed the hood. He told her to get in and try starting the car. Sure enough, the car started fine. She looked around to thank him, but he was gone. And for the rest of her life, that she believed that was her real guardian angel. (gasps) So note here how she talks about um, it was a man walking up in a white suit. Right? And that's what I thought very, I was very interesting. And as I was going through these thread. More and more people were talking about how they have a very similar story, and it's a man in a white suit. And I just found that insane. I'm like, you almost never see men walking around in white suits unless, like, you're... It's tacky. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine you're like, oh, white suit tacky. No, thank you. He's like, let me help your car. uh, I'm questioning your fashion choices. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) maybe, you know, I'm okay. But um, I just found that very fascinating how, you know, a lot of people's guardian angel appeared to be a man in a white suit. And a lot of times when we watch um, TV shows and they show, quote unquote, like a heaven, it's like people dressed in all white. So it's almost like your guardian angels taking form of what you're used to seeing. Yeah, exactly. That's the way I was going to say. I wonder if it's like, that's one of like, is it the chicken or the egg that came first kind yeah. of thing? Is it like, do we represent it like that because we're used to seeing that appar- apparition as a culture? Mm-hmm. Or do we see that apparition because that's what we expect because of what we see in pop culture? Exactly. Totally. So what would you think that would make you more susceptible to your guardian angel? So say it is not oh, someone please. that <laughs> you're like the hottest man. <laughs> I mean, not a white suit. That's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, say he's not a relative, or maybe he is okay. a relative. What would you in your head, if you're stranded on the side of the road, very like confused, you need to get home, you need your car working, but 
say you don't know much about cars. I don't know if you, I don't think you do. So you're like, shit, what would you make, make you comfortable? Um, okay. For the car situation in specific. Sure. Cause that's different, right? I think as much as I'd like to assume as much as much as I'd like to not have preconceived uh, prejudice and stuff like mm-hmm. that, probably would be a man mm-hmm. that like I'd be instantly more inclined to to trust. Um, definitely not a family relative. Do not trust anyone with that shit. <laughs> have to be a stranger. That's so funny. Someone who looked just I like know. your brother showed up, and you're like, "Oh, I know you know nothing about cars and kids." Honestly, as long as they're smiling and they have like kind eyes and they look kind, yeah, right. I think I'd be like, yeah, I need help. Please help mm-hmm. me. But like, they would have to be, you know, dressed appropriately for the weather because <laughs> otherwise I'd be like super concerned yeah. and kind of suspicious. You're in the middle of a snowstorm and you see someone walk up to you in flip flops. I'd be yeah. like, uh, don't you want to get that Dallas one first before your toes freeze off? <laughs> in mine however is like very 70s mechanic overalls a little bit tight a bit like 70s porn mechanic 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 guy so good old with the points yeah good (laughs) old-fashioned well this is so funny because like we're talking about the guy in the white suit and we're thinking of like how tv shows make um make us believe in like you know this guy in the white suit is "Quote unquote God from heaven." You're thinking of the "quote unquote" mechanic from these TV shows, you know, the I hot mean, mechanic. You can have a look under my hood. <laughs> That's so funny! Oh my god. Okay, well, like you, I think. I mean, unlike you, I think I would look for a familiar face. Like, I don't know much about cars, but I usually go to my father or my husband for help when it comes to cars. So I think, like, if I'm stranded there and I'm scared and alone and I see someone that, like, look like my dad, potentially, or my husband kind of walk through, I think that would comfort me a bit more. Yeah, but, like, wouldn't you be immediately triggered and freaked out and, like, because, like, you know consciously that they're not supposed to be there. Well, no, sorry, not my dad. Someone who looked like my dad, like resembled oh, look my dad. Like. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay, right. And I, like, like I, like, or like you know, think of your mechanic right now if you have one, and like if someone just looked like your mechanic. I mean, I don't think many of us have a go-to mechanic, but you know what I mean. No, I do. I do. Someone, someone that you would, someone that looks like someone you would trust with that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So this is the last story I have for you. And this literally okay. blew me away. And I've sent it okay. to you here. So if you want to read it. Okay, perfect. A friend and I were walking home from the club in Florence, Italy. We walked past an American girl walking the opposite way. Her GPS blaring where to go. She seemed drunk. We walked past her, pause, then turn around to look at her again. We turn around and there was an American man looking very fresh and clean for 4 a.m. He said, is that your friend over there? We said, no. He said, should you go be her friend? We went to walk her home and wait at her door for her friends to buzz her up. Right next to her apartment door was a man hiding behind a parked car exposed, jacking off the entire time we stood there. My friend and I held hands and booked it all the way home after the girl got inside safely. When we got home, we began discussing what just happened and said, what about that beautiful blonde man who told us to help her? He was wearing the exact outfit my dad used to wear on Sundays. She was like, blonde? No, he was Latino like me and he was dressed just like my dad. (gasps) I still think it's the weirdest thing that ever happened to me what that's what kind of blew me away they both had the same exact story but the man that that told them to go help that woman saying should you go be her friend to try and save that woman took form of someone they both would trust they saw two different people 
Wow. You know, and I think like if this man was dressed like just another man, maybe they wouldn't have thought twice to go help this woman. And I'm like, oh my god, that's so and like they couldn't reach her directly because she's in a, in Paris State, so they reached to some random people next to her to go yeah. help her. And I mean, like, what if this, like, the the woman that was drunk and they got her home safely, what if they had talked to her and she was like, oh, there was a man like my dad that told me, like, you know, like, I should go find help. But, like, she was, yeah, she was drunk and she didn't listen to him or something. That is really spooky. That freaked me I, out. I was like, I, I don't know what the third man syndrome is, but nothing but wholesome stories about this figure helping yeah. people. And well, you don't hear the bad stories because people aren't there to tell. Yeah, them. that's when their <laughs> their guardian angel failed. Uh, just joking, <laughs> just joking. Funny <laughs> thing. I was thinking more like, uh, what's the opposite of guardian? That I don't know. And a bad yeah. devil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Neglecting devil. <laughs> Actually, there was this one story about this guy. He was like, I remember once like a tree branch fell on him and he heard a voice inside his head say shit. <laughs> and he was kind of like, my guardian Asian wasn't helping me, but he did definitely agree with me. <laughs> the guardian Asian was a little slow That's there. Funny. He's like, I left you alone for five minutes and this is what you get up to. <laughs> but I thought um, That's hilarious. at the end, it's so fascinating like some people have encounters with another person um some people have encounters with what they perceive as an angel like man in a white suit or whatever and then some people's guardian angel is someone that they would trust you know yeah well that's interesting i think that's why earlier i said like i think i have a problem with the term mm -hmm. angel but like yeah if you're someone who who's been raised in that context and who believes uh, in, in in a specific religion, stuff like that, well then, yeah, maybe a man in a white suit would be the most comforting mm -hmm. thing for you, right? But then if you're someone who's, you know, it, someone different, it's like, well, yeah, just a kind-looking white man, apparently, is that blonde guy. <laughs> he dressed like my dad is what's comforting. Yeah. And someone else like, no, I'd like him to be Latino, yeah. you know? No, totally. So weird. I actually didn't even think of that, but it is at the end of the day, it's catered to you. And it's like, yeah, whether it's yeah. someone comforting a family member, or sometimes you're like, I don't trust no one. So it's the voice in your head that's your own voice, you know? True. Um, right. Yeah. And it's the voice in your head that's your own voice. <laughs> or there was some of the voices story, like this woman, she had two different voices in her head. Uh, maybe she doesn't even trust herself, um, right? <laughs> and some of the stories about the voice in the head was like, oh, it was the voice of my deceased father or mother, you know? Uh, a lot of people were like, no, it was my own voice that I heard in my head telling me what to do. So I just thought that it was insane. It could The third man syndrome is basically just about a, way, a presence around you that doesn't make you feel alone in your time of need. Wild. Um, that's that's really yeah, kind of like the definition, right? When a presence intervenes at a critical moment to offer you some encouragement, guidance, and support. So honestly, I'm looking forward for my third man syndrome to pop out the next time I'm in need. Well, hopefully, like you're not in that yeah. kind of need anytime soon. I really hope so. Because it's all yeah, it all seems like it's people who are were in very dangerous I know. situations. Watch us get in a car accident. And I'm like, where the fuck are you, boys? Yeah, <laughs> it's like um, I mean, I mean, I I'll be truly like disappointed. I would be suspicious of hearing my own yeah. voice. Yeah, I know. I <laughs> did I even tell you this? I have this thing where, like, every now and then, I'll hear like voices, like, like like auditory elucidation like i'm doing the dishes and i hear like a whisper or something or um and 
I thought it was normal. I thought this happened to everyone all the time because it happens frequently. And it's just like, it's like, oh, like, oh, I'd probably just imagine that or whatever. Sometimes it's my name. Sometimes it's a random sentence. Sometimes it's like, right? Is this, <laughs> like, like, is this how you okay. figure out you're schizophrenic? Like, <laughs> it's funny that you say that because when I told Justin, he's like, maybe it's schizophrenia. I was like, no, it's not schizophrenia. And then, like for the next like 30 minutes, he's Googling the symptoms of schizophrenia on his phone. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm thinking too. And we were at a party. I told that story to the entire group and he's just like there in the corner Googling. I'm at like, the party. I think everyone was probably like, oh, I tell him to go compare. Yeah. So what do they say to you? Nothing. It's not like they say full sentence. It's like I catch a glimpse of a conversation or catch like a glimpse of a voice or whatever. Okay, so they're not even Or sometimes like I'm about to fall asleep and sometimes it's my name though. But it doesn't feel directed to me all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's really just like a small glimpse. Interesting. Often when like I'm right about to fall asleep also. Sometimes it's well, I think when you're, more aggressive than When others. you're about to fall asleep, it might just be like your dreams. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just I think it's just like some my brain doing some random shit. Mm -hmm. Wait, am I just very, for... <laughs> Yeah. My next deep dive is gonna be. I think it's ghosts. Yeah. My wait, no, no. I, I take it back. I think you it's think ghosts. It's ghosts. I hear okay, ghosts. So... Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you take enough meds already yeah. as it is. I don't want to yeah. add some. Um. Yeah. Well, I hope it's oh not schizophrenia. God. I hope it's your guardian angel. Like, I hope it's. Well, you do have sleep apnea, so it's your guardian angel. But make sure your machine's on tight while you're falling asleep, and your guardian angel, or sorry, your the voices that looking out for you is like, uh, don't grip that knife too tight while you're washing dishes. I think that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's go with that. I like that. Uh, that's what I I'll tell my psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> in conclusion what i'd like to say is be kind to the voices in your head and if there are people talking to you maybe go get checked out um but yeah yeah that 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 story of the woman with the tumor is really really, really that cool. was insane that's also like not third man syndrome um I think all the other stories were, but not that one was. That just blew me away yeah. about the voice in her head. Um, but I think my favorite story is the last one. We just that was my favorite it's too. Just, like, it's crazy. I think that's so cool. Um, that's that really cool. There, the man looking out for that woman that was drunk appeared in two different forms for two different people in her time of need. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope you all enjoy. Wow. Yeah, what, what, what's that? Oh, oh they say well done. <laughs> <laughs> I got so scared. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm worried about you. Let's go get you some help. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, bye everyone. Talk to bye. you next week. All the voices um, in our head. Enjoy. Yes, everyone, everybody says bye. Bye. Tell Me Like I'm Stupid is created and produced by us, Sonia and Toma. You can follow us on Instagram at Tell Me Like I'm Stupid. If you'd like to support us, please subscribe and review on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Our cover art was created by Ish. Find him on Instagram at h.e.e.s.h. Thank you for listening.